Hello everyone, welcome to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And in this episode, we're covering the dates of November 30th through December 6th. We're also going to generally talk about December and preview the entire month. So we're gonna look at the great constellations we're seeing again. We'll talk about the peak of the annual Geminid meteor shower in the middle of the month. We'll get a chance to mention the winter solstice and one of the greatest planetary conjunctions we've seen in years coming up as well. So let's dive on in. This is the time of year we can expect the sun to set earliest and our nights to be longest as we approach that winter solstice, especially if you're in the northern hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, then this is complete opposite. So for us northern hemisphere dwellers, we're gonna set our sun. You'll notice the sun sets more in the south because it sits lowest in our sky at this time. We'll talk more about that later. So we'll get that sun to set pretty early for this time of the year. And at the beginning of this week here on November 30th, we have a full moon. So when there's a full moon, it's opposite of the sun in our horizon. So if you notice, we'll turn ourselves around here and look towards the east and there you'll find our full moon. You can find it right there, rising and being very bright during a full moon. That's the only time you can see the moon for the entire night. And as I mentioned in the previous episode, on Monday morning, which has already happened if you're watching this later on Monday, we had a penumbral lunar eclipse. This is when the moon passed into the secondary shadow of the Earth. So it's not a total lunar eclipse. Actually, it's a partial penumbral lunar eclipse. And lunar eclipses can only happen during a full moon, so it makes sense here. Uh, if you did have a chance to see this, this was very early in the morning if you're on the East Coast and for most of North America. For us, it was 443 in the morning and you probably didn't notice much of a dimming of the moon, maybe just by a little bit. Um, but it's kind of an interesting event and that has already happened. But for the beginning of the week, we have a very large moon. And even though for astronomers, the large moon does obscure the sky, makes it hard to see all sorts of objects. It does light up the terrain around you and makes for a beautiful landscape at night with the full moon. You can just see a little bit better as you walk outside or maybe hike at night. The full moon is great for those types of activities. For this week and for the rest of the month, we can start to appreciate those really bright winter stars and constellations that are so famous. And if we're looking towards the east here, uh, during this week we can find our very large moon starting with that full moon on the 30th, moving through these winter constellations. If you're up a little bit later at night, maybe around the 9, 10 o'clock time frame. So if we speed up time, this is on Monday, you'll see the moon's actually within the constellation called Taurus the Bull, a very famous winter constellation, of course, one of the signs of the zodiac. I did mention on episodes last month that the great Pleiades star cluster right up here really marks almost the beginning or at least the hint of winter uh, that winter is right around the corner and so that's getting higher and higher up and that sits in the back and shoulder of Taurus and as we go through the week you'll find the moon move through various zodiac signs and winter constellations it'll eventually move into the Gemini twins here with the two heads of the twins that are very prominent Pollux and Castor here uh, and then we continue on through the rest of the week as the moon moves a little farther away out of the view as it's waning and you're seeing less and less of it uh, and you have to stay up later to find that moon. And for the rest of this month, we can really appreciate more of these winter stars and constellations. So along with Taurus and Gemini, one of the most famous groupings of stars in our sky and one of the most famous mythologies, for, at least from Greek mythology, centers around the constellation Orion the Hunter. And this is a great one. Uh, you'll find Orion's belt here, which is so noticeable. Orion's shoulders, legs, and feet that we have here. So let's turn on Orion the hunter, as we call him. And not far from him are his two hunting dogs, Canis Major with the brightest star in our sky, Sirius, and Canis Minor here with another bright star called Procyon there. And one other winter group of stars, and especially a single star that really is prominent, is if you look a little higher up, you can actually see a little bit earlier uh, before winter begins. Not far from Taurus the Bull, we have here 
what's called Ariga, the charioteer, with the very bright star called Capella. And so these constellations and stars really are great. They're bright, they're easy to spot, and they're part of constellations that are very famous and are actually kind of easy to figure out. So these bright stars are really great. We'll talk more about them through the month and all the wonderful shapes and different things you can find in this area. Focusing back in on this wonderful winter constellation, Gemini, one of the greatest meteor showers you can find all year is happening in the middle of the month, which is called the Geminids. And the Geminids are named that way because the radiant point for this meteor shower lies near the head of one of the twins, Castor here. We can turn on that radiant point and we'll find it about there. This is Castor and this is the head of Pollux. So near Castor's head, you can find that radiant. And again, with radiance, it's not exactly where you see the meteors, it's where you can expect them to be traced back to. And this meteor shower is a peaking on the evening of the 13th and really best the morning of the 14th and even the morning of the 15th. Usually mornings, as I've said many times before, are the best times to watch meteor showers. So that is no different for the Geminids. And this particular meteor shower is really great. If you have all the right conditions, which we might this year, you'll have possibly 120 meteors per hour, even more, depending on how many meteors we're going through that particular year. And this one's quite unique. Most meteor showers usually are from the debris trail of comets, those icy uh, rocky objects in the solar system. But for Geminids, this comes from mostly a rocky object, an asteroid called 3200 Phaeton. And this asteroid provides some very slow moving meteors, ones that are yellowish in color. You can get these bright fireballs that move across the sky. It's a great show. And what's also great this year is that the moon is near new. So we don't have the bright moon obscuring the sky, making it hard to see the dimmer meteors. So this could potentially be a really good year for Geminids, especially if you have a clear sky, you go to a dark location, and with a moonless, practically moonless sky, this could be a great one. So definitely take a look at the Geminids in the middle of December, could be a good show. On December 21st, you can expect our annual winter solstice, which for us in the Northern Hemisphere marks the beginning of winter, and if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it marks the beginning of summer, and this is all due to Earth's tilt. So we are now tilted, at least by this date, farthest from the sun in the Northern Hemisphere, which puts the sun lowest in the southern sky. That's why the sun sets lowest and rises lowest in the sky at this time of the year. So we're getting less energy from the sun. That's why it's typically cooler. We're just not getting as much of that energy from our nearest star. And if you look here on the screen, you'll find this is the ecliptic, the path that the sun makes in the sky. That's the plane of our solar system. And notice the equator up here. Take Earth's equator and you shoot it to the sky. That would be the celestial equator. So during the winter solstice, the sun sits lowest below it or farthest from the celestial equator. And after the solstice, then the sun begins its upward journey north, approaching that equator again, eventually crossing it by the spring equinox or the vernal equinox in March. So this is an important time of year, kind of marking a change of seasons. And it marks that time of year when our days are typically shortest and our nights are longest. And that is fun to celebrate. And also on December 21st, we have probably one of the greatest celestial events of 2020 and maybe for many, many years. And that is a conjunction of two large gas planets. We've been waiting for this to happen all year long as Jupiter and Saturn have been getting closer and closer to our line of sight to where we can see them almost overlap. And what's great on the evening of December 21st, that winter solstice night, is if you're looking low in the southwest, you may notice what looks like two objects super close. And Stellarium can't even differentiate between the two, they're so close. But in the actual sky, you may see them as two separate objects. You look down here in the southwest or so, near the sun setting, so you don't have a lot of time to see this, are the two planets Jupiter and Saturn. So if I zoom in, you will see how close this conjunction is, and it will separate better as we get closer and closer to the largest planet, and the planet, of course, with beautiful rings around it. Look at that. 
So there we have a conjunction when you have two or more planets getting close to each other, and this is a very close conjunction. This is the closest Jupiter and Saturn have been since the year 1623, and even then, which was not long after Galileo first took a telescope to look at the sky, it was very close to the sun, so many people probably never saw it. And so this opportunity may be one of the first times, at least in modern human history, we have seen Jupiter and Saturn like this, and it won't be this close until the year 2080. So take advantage of this amazing conjunction of these two planets, and to understand how close they are, they're a tenth of a degree. Uh, a degree in the sky is uh, twice the width of a full moon. So you could say half a degree is the width of a full moon or the sun. And so tenth of a degree means this is about a fifth of the full moon's diameter, how close they are. So this is a very, very close conjunction. And if you have binoculars, this could be a cool view to see the two planets and even their moons together. So we zoom in, you'll see on the left, this is Jupiter, and then Saturn, you can see little dots around it. Those are moons. And if you're an astrophotographer, or maybe even getting into this your first time, this is a great time to take a picture of these two planets being so close and sharing kind of the same area with their moons nearby. Of course, in real life, these planets are not close. This is just from our perspective. And every 20 years or so, they get rather close. So last time, this was in the year 2000. Um, but it wasn't as close as we see it in the year 2020. So this is a great thing to look forward to, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. I'm going to talk much more about it in later episodes this month, and so stay tuned, but I hope you get a chance to see that and many other things for December. We have a lot in store for the rest of the year. This concludes another episode of The Sky Tonight. Thanks again for tuning in. And as always, if you're in town in Daytona Beach, please visit our museum, especially our Loman Planetarium. If you come in and you buy regular admission, you get a show for free. If you're a member, you get all the shows for free, which is a great deal. And I hope to see you back for more episodes of The Sky Tonight. I hope you get a chance to get out there and stargaze and find these great objects in our sky. Good luck, take care, and again, happy stargazing.